Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Laurel Page, and I am the Assistant Director of Events at the University of Colorado Boulder's LEAD School of Business. Welcome to our seventh COVID-19 webinar series. These continue to be trying times, and here at CU Boulder, we have gathered our world-renowned faculty and alumni to provide frank and timely insights for life during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today is the first of six webinars in this COVID-19 related webinar series. To view upcoming webinars, please visit colorado.edu backslash business backslash alumni. Click the drop down arrow and click attend online webinars. For today's webinar, we're excited to welcome Professor Dr. Sarah Sawyer here presenting COVID-19, just one in a series of viruses jumping from animals to humans. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask Sarah, please send a question through the Q&A interface. We will monitor questions as they are submitted and Sarah will respond to them at the end of the presentation. As a reminder of optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speaker. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants tomorrow along with a survey link and supplemental resources from today's presentation. Now I am excited to introduce today's speaker. Sarah Sawyer is a professor in the BioFrontiers Institute at CU Boulder. Dr. Sawyer has received numerous prestigious awards, including national and international prizes in virology. In 2011, she was awarded a research medal from President Obama at the White House. She holds a PhD in genetics and development from Cornell University. In 2020, she started Darwin Biosciences, which helps or develops infectious disease diagnostics. She serves as a senior editor at the journal eLife and serves as a government consultant on the topic of pandemic defense. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand over the webinar controls to you now. Well, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for taking time out of your day to attend this webinar. Uh, just for context, I wanted to give you a, a little bit of setting here. My research lab is located at the BioFrontiers Institute under this star. Uh, the, it's located on East Campus. This photo is taken from the mountains. So you can see that it's about a mile beyond the main campus, which is shown here in the foreground. The BioFrontiers Institute is a really special place. In fact, I moved my lab to Boulder in 2015 specifically to join this institute. It's really the closest thing I've seen to a successful biotech incubator operating at a university. It's the home to, of faculty who are absolutely biotech titans like Leslie Leinwand and Tom Check. Tom has a Nobel Prize. Leslie uh, just sold a company in October of this past year for $13 billion to Bristol Myers Squibb on a heart drug that she developed. That's actually uh, the second company that she sold for in the billions of dollars. And Marv Carruthers, who is an Am who started Amgen and Applied Biosciences, and who also received the National Medal of Science from George W. Bush. So this is a really, really special and elite group of entrepreneurs and biologists housed in the BioFrontiers building, trying to translate basic science discoveries into business and things that make people healthier and live longer. And now the Institute is exploding with innovation and full of biotech babies, as those of us in the next generation stand on the shoulders of these giants. We have numerous faculty startup companies in the building, about 10 in the last five years. And today I'm gonna to tell you about my research and then a little about my company, Darwin Biosciences. The talk should only take about 25 minutes. My research is on the topic of zoonosis. And I wanna quickly define that word. 
zoo means of animals and gnosis is from the Greek word for disease as in diagnosis. And so a zoonosis is a disease which can be transmitted to humans from animals. And there's pretty good job security in this field of zoonosis. In fact, SARS-2, the virus that causes COVID, is just the latest in a nonstop stream of viruses emerging from nature, from animals. This is a list of highlights from about the last nine years, things you probably heard about on NPR. And all of these viruses started as animal viruses in birds, bats, rodents, camels, or primates. And they've now begun to infect humans. And so these human viruses have just been born. Because of this, they can have staggering fatality rates, commonly 10% or more. Given this, we're actually really lucky that the fatality rate of SARS-2 is less than 1%. The last pandemic, which began in the 80s with HIV AIDS, was caused by a virus that jumped from chimpanzees. That virus, HIV, had a 100% fatality rate, has killed 35 million people, and 40 years later, we still don't have a vaccine for HIV. Another quality of these new viruses, new to human viruses, is that they don't spread well from human to human usually. But as we all now know with SARS-CoV-2, sometimes that's not true and they do spread very well. Okay, so I wanna dig deep on this topic of zoonosis. And I wanna start by introducing you to the first principles of this field. What are the key ingredients required for a successful zoonosis to occur? For, in the, for instance, in this cartoon, for this bat to transmit its green virus to humans and start making humans sick. Well, there are really three principles here. The first is opportunity. Species B, humans here, has to come into contact with species A in order for there to be any chance for this transmission to occur. The second one uh, is with, um, refers to the following. Most data supports the idea that if you just ground up bats and injected that matter with all of its viruses into humans, they wouldn't do anything because the vast majority of bat viruses are adapted to bats, not to humans. And so the second principle is that we have to wait for human compatible variants to arise in the bats virus population that can infect humans. And then finally, the virus may need to acquire additional mutations to refine itself for spread in the new species, humans, once it's there. So I want to go into these a little bit more in depth because there are so many important lessons here for the current pandemic. First, I want to talk about the concept of opportunity. For example, Hopefully you heard about the 2014-2015 Ebola epidemic in West Africa, the largest Ebola epidemic in history. It killed over 11,000 people there. And it began in a small town called Miliandu, Guinea, shown here. Don't feel bad if you've never heard of it. There are only 30 homes in this village. But the index case, meaning the first known infected person in that epidemic, was a toddler that lived in this village. The next to die were his immediate family members and then the, the villagers and then the epidemic spread from there. Very close to this toddler's home was this tree. And the villagers who were interviewed by epidemiologists told them two things about this tree. First, they said that local kids used to play in it, including the child who was the index case. It looks pretty fun, right? You can see it looks like a tent. I'd want to play in there too if I was a kid. The other thing that the villagers told the researchers is that the top of the tree was a roosting, net for bat, net, roosting site for bats. So it's possible that bats started this epidemic and that the bats were infected, they came through and the children came in contact with either their feces or the bats themselves, contracted Ebola and then began to get others in their village. And then that child began to get others in the village sick. And opportunity was also key in both the SARS-1 and SARS-2 pandemics, both of which appear to have risen in the, arisen in the live animal food markets of China. 
With SARS, two, with SARS-1, the first SARS that emerged in 2002, we actually know with exquisite detail how that happened. In these live animal food markets, a certain animal called a palm civet was being sold and palm civets eat fruit. So the animal handlers were placing inside their cages here bowls of fruit at night for them to eat. And then bats were flying in from the forest and coming in through those bars in the crate and eating the fruit and drooling all over the fruit. And it appears that palm civets contracted a virus from bats and then they infected humans when humans bought and ate the palm civets. Potentially even just a single human was infected by a single palm civet that then began that epidemic. And so here I just point out the bats and the humans had been living in proximity forever. It wasn't until the third species, palm civet, came in between and provided this evolutionary stepping stone for this virus to emerge from bats into humans. Uh, it, the story is less clear with SARS-CoV-2, but it um, almost certainly was again the same scenario. It's, the virus is very closely related to viruses found in bats. It's not clear what the other species was at this point, but there's some evidence that it could have been this very strange animal here, a pangolin, and that somehow the viruses of those two species met to give rise to the human virus. I will come back to that in a second. And indeed, in 2000, you know, I teach about SARS-1 in my class here on the campus. I have for many years since 2002. And when I heard in December of 2019 on NPR that there, was, there were cases of a new disease and most of the, the new cases were tracked to a single animal market, I really honestly had shivers because I knew that was a recipe for a zoonosis humans and animals mixing in strange combinations. And my worst fears were in fact true. We had another SARS-1 type event. Okay, so principle two. I mentioned the, the, so the human and the animal have to meet, there has to be opportunity, but not just any old virus can transmit between an animal and a human. We have to wait for human compatible variants to arise. So this example comes from the most famous zoonosis that has occurred, the transmission of simian immunodeficiency virus of chimpanzees to humans giving rise to HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. I'm showing you here the protein sequence of a viral protein that both of these viruses encode. It's called matrix. The amino acids in these proteins are, this, each letter is an amino acid that makes the protein function. Now we know that this cross-species transmission occurs several times, giving rise to the major flavors of HIV that now cir circulate on Earth. Scientists noticed that each time this had occurred, the transmission was accompanied by the same methionine to arginine mutation in the 30th position of this protein. And in fact, if you take HIV and passage it back through chimps, this position reverts back to a methionine. So this was a key species specific mutation that almost certainly reflects a genetic difference between human and chimps. Other mutations occurred as well, but this is the only one that was sort of reliable and predict predictive of the species in which that virus was replicated. Now, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, the human compatible variant was something we call a recombinant. This can occur when a single animal individual gets infected with two different viruses at the same time. Errors in the copying can result in the formation of a hybrid virus. And SARS-2 has the following structure. The red portions of the viral genome look virtually identical to a bat coronavirus. And this small green region right here, which allows entry through the cell surface receptor, ACE2, this is the, the surface protein spike against which the vaccines are being directed. That came from what ap that appears to have come from a pangolin coronavirus because it is virtually identical in sequence to that same motif from the pangolin virus. Okay, so you can have human compatible variants arise. Maybe they're recombinants, maybe they just have point mutations, 
the point is once you have one of these and a single person gets infected, once one person is infected, they can infect others. This is a picture of soldiers at a military base in Kansas during World War I. If you note the date of this picture, November 1918, something very special was happening during this time. The 1918 flu pandemic was beginning to unfold. These guys are watching a football game at Camp Funston, the base where the first cases of the 1918 flu were recorded. It's very likely, almost certain, that by November, some of the men in this photo are already infected with that flu strain. It's a cold November day in Kansas. A single sneeze in this crowd could potentially get tens of other people sick. These men would, over the next weeks or months, be shipped off to the far corners of the world, taking that virus with them. It's interesting to speculate that this moment right here was the key moment that set the 1918 flu on its disastrous course. Of course, we will never know. It's just to make a point that transmission occurs once that first human gets infected and certain factors can speed it up. I have this photo because my great grandfather is in it, Harvey Gann. Harvey Gann, my great grandfather was just charged from this base, Camp Funston, just 16 days after this photo was taken. So I may not have a lot going for me in life, but I am a selected survivor of the 1918 flu. I'm going to pretend that everyone's laughing. Okay. Once spread begins, once that sneeze occurs, evolution will begin to shape the sequence of the virus, perfecting it for humans. This, ha this has happened before and it's happening now with SARS-CoV-2. This is an example hearkening back to that 2014-15 Ebola epidemic that killed 11,000. That virus began spreading in the country of Guinea in Africa in uh, the early months of 2014. In March of 2014, a genetic variant was observed. It was a single letter change in the protein that makes up the surface protein of the virus. The same thing we're now making vaccines against for SARS-CoV-2. Just a few months later, we can now track that new variant in orange. And you can see that almost all new infections are now occurring with that new variant. And a year later, that variant has now overtaken the, the epidemic and is causing almost all of the new infections. And so it is with COVID. We have, um, a vi we have uh, an, the ancestral virus that began in Wuhan. The virus is mutating. And one thing that you may or may not know is that very early on, there was a single letter change in that surface protein. It's called D614G. And it arose at the very beginning of the pandemic. But in the past year, it has gone to 100% fixation. And it has eliminated the virus that started out in Wuhan, that virus in gray is now gone. And the proportion of viruses is now 100% of the D614G lineage. You are seeing a virus perfecting itself for spread in humans. It doesn't mean it's making itself deadlier. That's a different topic altogether. It's perfecting itself for spread in humans. Now, from this D614 variant, which has overtaken the population, the, the pandemic has now gone on so long and infected so many people that we're having all sorts of different offshoots happen, new mutations. The UK variant, the South Africa variant, the Brazil variant, which is not shown on here. And these are moving in different directions. Some of them are even getting convergent mutations, shared mutations or mutations that were acquired soon after D614G that have been separated in other ways. And so we will continue to have to deal with these variants. We will continue to have to monitor them and figure out what they mean for our vaccines. All indications so far are that the vaccines will probably interact differently with these variants, at least in some cases, but there should still be cross protection and there should be still some level of protection against these new variants. That's really a little bit of speculation. There's not a whole lot of data on these variants because they are so very new. Okay, 
we have three tools to fight against this virus and all of its variants. We have vaccines, which is a medicine that you take before you get sick to try to keep from getting sick. We have drugs, which are important to you once you become sick and you're in the hospital and you're hoping for some magic drug that can help you get through the worst case scenario should that unfold. And we have public health measures where we can test and contact trace and monitor. And so I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about COVID testing, because I think we are getting ready to enter a new phase of how we think about COVID testing and perhaps disease screening in general. So we're all familiar with the concept of getting sick, going to your doctor and getting tested. You probably had a flu test at your doctor's office before or any other type of test that's commonly performed. The problem is this. We know how to deal with sick people. And in general, sick people, people that are experiencing symptoms are generally cautious and they stay, especially during a pandemic and they stay away from other people and try to limit the spread until they get that diagnosis and understand what's going on with them. Here's the problem. In this cartoon, I have a woman at work and she's thinking to herself about her colleagues. I feel safe at work because I know my coworkers are being screened for COVID-19 every day. Of course, we know this isn't happening. These are healthy people. They're at work. It doesn't mean, though, that they're not going to have COVID symptoms two days later and potentially be highly contagious even now or tomorrow. What's really needed to make workplaces and schools safe is on-site same-day testing so that we can find people with when they're contagious and keep them from unwittingly spread, spreading the virus. That will make people feel safe at work and help our economy to reopen as we navigate through this difficult time where we're waiting to get the vaccines in place and waiting to see what the virus does. I just wanted to say that BioFrontiers has been a leader in COVID testing in the state. Roy Parker, our institute director, and Leslie Linewan, they set up, a campus test, set up campus testing centers at the beginning of the school year. They run five days a week. Anyone on our campus and their family members can go get tested by just spitting in a tube and receive results later that day or the next morning. Uh, their operation has performed over 73,000 COVID tests this school year on members of the university uh, community. And here we are, I'm here, I was part of the team this morning. We're testing the um, football team one early morning in the fall. Meanwhile, my company, Darwin Biosciences, has been doing outreach, particularly trying to help some of the smaller universities in our state and other entities. And to do that, to try to get at that same day instant testing, we had to come up with a test. And so we came up with a test very early on. We had the test working by March. Uh, and then by May, we were deploying it in front of our building. You'll recall that most of us didn't even shut down until mid-March. By May, we were set up outside the BioFrontiers building, testing our colleagues in an experimental mode to see if the test would work. And our test is actually super cool. So I just have to tell you about it just quickly. You basically spit in a tube. We add some chemicals. We wait for 30 minutes. And if there's COVID in your saliva, the tube pops bright yellow. It's called an RT lamp test. And you can remember that because the lamp is like a light bulb turning on, like the yellow color that we get with a positive result. We do three tests on every person. This is an example of a negative. Here's their positive control. We always want to see that one pop yellow because that tells us the test is working. But this person does not pop yellow for either of the SARS-2 indicator tubes. This is a positive result where this person turns all three, their saliva turns all three of these tubes yellow. So it's that simple. We are set up around the state. Here we are at a university on the western slope. There at that university, Darwin is running out of mobile tiny houses where students come and get a, give a saliva sample for testing. Um, we've, had, we've done a lot of things with these universities to try to help them operate and stay in business. Here's a quote from another university that we're helping. On Thursday, we screened members of our cross country team and cleared them for competition at their conference meet this Saturday. Cove Lab, that's the, what Darwin calls this test, 
same day results, ensure that we have the most up-to-date information. Here's an example of some of the results we did on a different sports team. In this case, each person just got two tests. So a negative result is yellow, pink. So you can see yellow, pink, yellow, pink, yellow, pink, all negative. But on this team, we found one individual that was harboring that virus. They had no idea. They didn't feel bad yet at all. We were able to warn them, send them for further follow-up testing. But in the meantime, put them on notice that they might, be, uh, they might be experiencing an infection and to be careful of infecting other people. There's huge value in that. Knowledge is power. Remember that old saying? Knowing that you're infected can really help us protect the people that are our coworkers and our families. Okay, I don't have time to tell you today. We have a couple other really exciting ongoing trials for respiratory diagnostics. I'm the lead PI on a big, huge pandemic study being con conducted on the campus. We have a lot of labs, a lot of professors involved. We are taking survey data and looking at donated saliva from students and trying to understand how to best do diagnosis and how to treat the campus as a little mini community where we can ex experiment on ways to best control spread and keep people safe. Uh, we are also running a trial with the US Marines on, on other respiratory diagnostics that could help with this situation. Okay, I finally just wanted to share a final thought on vaccines. So, you know, I am pro-vaccine and a highly vaccinated citizen, but I have been a little concerned about the number of doctors that I've seen on the news making statements like this. No steps were skipped in coronavirus vaccine rollout. You know, in some ways that's true, but if you wouldn't, will allow me to just take a minute to sort of do an autopsy on this statement. So vaccine trials look for four things. They look for short-term efficacy and short-term safety. They also are supposed to look for long-term efficacy and long-term safety. Remember, efficacy is how well the vaccine keeps you from getting infected with what it's supposed to guard against. Safety is totally different. Safety is about side effects. And so short-term safety, this one right here, usually refers to things that that are acute and that come up in a short window after you receive that shot, like maybe seven days. Long-term safety could be things like autoimmune issues, which might take years to arise. And there's no data that suggests these vaccines are gonna lead to that. I'm just saying, what the point I'm trying to make is that you cannot warp speed these second two. There is no way in a four month trial that you can assess long-term efficacy and long-term safety. There's just no way to do it. And I'm okay with this for vaccines that are based on traditional paradigms that we've used many times in the past because we know they're safe. My concern is about the fact that we have first of their class vaccines that are skipping the long-term safety um, trials. And we don't know if there could be long-term safety effects. I think there needs to be more conversation about that. Without a doubt, these vaccines are worth it for older and high risk people. <clears throat> COVID is just too dangerous for them. And I've recommended it to my own parents to get these vaccines, any vaccine they can get. But what about for the millions of 25 year old mothers out there for whom COVID is very little risk? There needs to be a conversation about the relative risks for people in different categories. And my recommendation would be that for younger people, we should use va utilize vaccines based on more traditional vaccine platforms. Okay, I'm happy to answer more questions about vaccines. In my final couple slides, I am going to get a little bit existential. I'm gonna to switch topics and talk to you for just one second about tent caterpillars. These particular tent caterpillars are denuding an aspen forest in New Mexico. They've eaten every leaf in sight and they're experiencing a population outbreak. Um, this, is their, this is the ecological definition of population outbreak. Population outbreaks are characterized by rapid changes in population density over several orders of magnitude. Only a small number of species have outbreaks, like some insects and some rodents. And so you can see that we're having one here. Now, what does nature do about these? Interestingly, nature has a, a very 
a very nice way of taking care of these. I, or when maybe nice isn't the right word. Nature uses pathogens to extinguish population outbreaks. I have to share this piece of data with you because there, this is from a paper where a group of ecologists has diligently over 30 years gone to the same island in British Columbia and counted the number of tent caterpillar tents, they live in tents over the years. That's first on the y-axis and the bars. You can see that it's a log scale. So over the years, there have been three population outbreaks where that magnitude in um, population goes up logarithmically. Now, if we look on the right-hand side, we're looking at the percent of tent families, the tents, living groups, that are infected with a virus that kills these caterpillars. When there's no outbreak on, the virus is undetectable. But when there is an outbreak on, this virus surges up through the caterpillars in a sort of frequency dependent manner. When there are lots of caterpillars crowded together, the virus spreads very well. And you can see the virus comes up and knocks these outbreaks down time and time again. And so in his recent book, Spillover, David Quammen proposes a very interesting idea to explain the 1918 flu, HIV, Zika, COVID, and all these other zoonoses. He asks the question very provocatively, are humans an outbreak species? Is it possible that our population is just so dense that these viruses spread extremely well? And I fear that this will be an issue we continue to face. And so we have to place it at the top of our list of importance and figure out ways to make uh, ourselves less susceptible to these viruses. And with that, I will conclude. I just wanna thank my amazing team shown here. You can see they're all incredibly good looking people and I might add very intelligent too. My um, colleague Nick Meyerson has worked with me for a long time. He's now leaving the research group to become the CEO of Darwin. I also want to give a special shout out to Roy Parker, the director of the BioFrontiers Institute, for doing such an amazing job fostering the culture in this environment. Okay, with that, I will take questions. Thank you, Sarah. As a reminder, if you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A interface. First question is, what are the chances that this virus will go away if we can attain herd immunity? Right, so I will remind you, there are many instances of viruses going away. SARS coronavirus one did not spread nearly as well as this virus. And it did go away. Public health measures shut it down, shut down its spread, and it's gone from the planet. Smallpox is gone from the planet. That virus was eliminated by a very effective vaccination campaign. Polio is almost gone from the planet. Zika, almost gone. Remember Zika? <laughs> the little babies that had you know, birth defects in that horrible, horrible time when we were talking about Zika. Do you hear about Zika anymore? It is actually still out there, but just breaks out in, on little islands and remote places here and there. It's largely gone. And that's because of herd immunity. So I think because this virus, is, as long as it's strictly replicating in humans, it's possible it could go away. If it's back and forthing between us and animals, it will be very hard to ever get rid of it because we can't vaccinate every animal that, that might be involved. And so it could. I think the more likely scenario is that it doesn't come away, do, sorry, doesn't go away, but it acquires mutations that make it into a virus that's very similar to the seasonal coronaviruses that we already have. It will just become another one of those. I will point out the 1918 flu was around for many years after its devastating initial year but it changed its pathogenicity and basically just became like a seasonal flu after the first couple of years. Thank you. What are the chances that this virus will mutate continually and will prevent us from becoming immune in this way? So there's always cross protection. And as, as evidence of that, I wanna say the following. We, you remember early in the pandemic, you would read about 
antigen, antibody test to look to see who had been infected, who has antibodies to SARS, uh, SARS-2, as a way to like determine who you know, might be safe to go out in the community. Largely, people have given up on that because what we found is that any antibody test that any test that determines whether we have antibodies to this virus also cross reacts if we have antibodies to the seasonal viruses. That tells us that there's a lot of antibody overlap in these viruses. And so I think that um, you know, new variants certainly are going to be less different to this virus than seasonal viruses are. And so they're expected to have that same level of cross reactivity and cross protection. So I do think vaccines are absolutely worth it no matter what's going on with variants. And you will have, I predict, even though a vaccine says it's 60% efficacious, similar to what the flu vaccine is, what we know from the history of vaccinology is that the other 40% who still get infected despite the vaccine have a much milder disease because of it. And so for that reason, vaccines are a really good idea. Thank you, Sarah. Um, how can scientists be certain of the source of this new virus? Yes, right. So there's, there is a theory that it popped out of a lab in China, a high containment virology lab. I'm not sure if that's what the question is alluding to. Um, Nobody can rule that out. There have been lab accidents in history. There's a well-known one that occurred with the flu some time ago, not in our country, but in another country, not China either. Um, nobody can rule that out for sure. I think that you know, inspect, you know, uh, investigations should be done into that hypothesis and, and to rule it in or rule it out maybe by the World Health Organization. But you know what? It's just so much more parsimonious that this virus jumped out of nature like the hundreds before it have done. You know, I mean, we see these viruses popping out from nature almost every year. Often they are recombinants. Often they have mutations that make them different slightly from the ones we find in nature. There are viruses in bats that you can align at the sequence level. They're virtually identical to this virus. So I just think it's so much more likely that this is just the next rung in the ladder that just goes on and on and on throughout history and forward in time as well. Thank you, Sarah. Our next question comes from Camille. Um, does your research include other vector-borne diseases or was Zika a special exception for your lab? Mm, good question. We, we work on dengue virus, which is a mosquito-borne virus. I got into that after I moved into the BioFrontiers facility uh, you, uh, here at University of Colorado. You might be interested to know the, the Centers for Disease Control is located in Atlanta, Georgia. But there's one section of the CDC that is not in Atlanta, and that is the insect-borne pathogen unit. Can you think why? You have Atlanta, a big, dense, hot city with lots of mosquitoes. If there were to be a leak out of the facility, that could be a disaster. So they put the insect-borne path pathogen unit of the CDC up in Fort Collins because, you know, we have so few bugs here. And so, um, indeed, we do. And so there are a tremendous number of dengue, Zika, and other, and, and researchers on other insect-borne viruses in this area right here on the Front Range because of that facility up in Fort Collins and the excellent virologists that are also at Colorado State University up there because they want to be colleagues with those folks at the CDC. Thank you, Sarah. Our next question comes from Lynn. Uh, what about the SA mutation with regards to reinfection? I understand that congregate, um, congregate plasma is not effective against the virus. Isn't congregate plasma parallel to vaccine development? So wouldn't it also be difficult to adapt a vaccine to this new variant? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the question the question is probably referring to convalescent serum, which and it's a very informed question. I thank you for that nice question because it's true. It, any test where convalescent serum, which contains an antibody response, doesn't work against a variant, has very bad in, indication for the vaccine translating to that variant. That is true. 
I think we, one thing that you should remember is that the ability of virus to recognize and counteract a virus has to be done in, in tissue culture in, in a, literally a test tube because we can't experimentally infect humans. Um, and so sometimes when you see that, and an, you're not gonna have the entire immune system in that test tube, you're just gonna have some parts of it. So we have many times in the vaccine field been misled in both directions by results in test tubes not being exactly like what we then see in humans. Luckily, two of the vaccines are currently under trial in South Africa where that South African variant is, is occurring. And so naturally they're out of that very soon. They're saying within a week or two, they will be able to release data on how effective these vaccines are in that specific country where one of these uh, variants containing that mutation predominates. Thank you, Sarah. Our next question comes from Martin. Do you have an estimate what the CT values would be for your positive tests? Are you working on a rapid antigen test which might provide more temporarily effective actionable recommendations for quarantine? Right, man, I, you know how many years I wished that CT value was an everyday word? I really, thank you, I, you're probably a biotech person, but I'm gonna pretend that you're just a lay person who now knows what CT values are. The CT cutoff for our test to have 95% sensitivity and specificity is a CT of 30. And that uh, is not as sensitive as RT-PCR, which is the gold standard for diagnostic tests. We use our tests as like a, a better version of the temperature check that you get when you walk in the door. It's a screening test. Importantly though, its limit of detection is below where we think actually people are actually carrying contagious virus that they can give to others. And I say that, I wish I would have brought a certain diagram. People have to have a viral load. For those of you in the know, you can tune out for a second here if you don't care about this stuff, but people need to have a viral load of about 10 to the six virions per mil, which is about CT30, right where our test stands in order for um, people to isolate live virus from those people in laboratory isolation assays. In other words, said another way, we almost never find live virus in, people's, in people in the range CT30 to CT40. And what I mean by we there is the literature, like the examples where people have tried to isolate virus. And so there's a lot of, not even a great consensus on whether people between CT30 and 40 are even infectious to others and whether we even want to find them. And so uh, we, our test captures more than 99% of the circulating virions in the community because they are asympt <laughs> asymmetrically distributed with a few people carrying the vast majority. And so for this reason, there's a lot of value for screening, even if it's not quite as high sensitivity as what you would get in the doctor's office. Thank you, Sarah. The next question comes from Kelly. Um, can you say more about the vaccine rollout and your slide about younger participants? <laughs> I wish I could. You know, there, I wish we could just pay more money and get long-term safety data, but there's no amount of money that can buy that information. Long-term safety takes long-term to understand it. You know, the, I think the way the FDA is looking at this is that these vaccines are safe in the short term, so we're going to assume they're safe in the long term, and that might be 100% right. I hope that is right, you know, but it is. I do think it's worth thinking about that these are first of their class vaccines, and I'm not sure that that is where we want to make that gamble. I definitely would make that gamble on more tried and true vaccine paradigms because they've been out there, you know, for other viruses and other pathogens already. But this is a brave new world. And like I said, it's a no brainer for people that are facing extreme COVID risk. COVID is dangerous, full stop. Like I said, I would tell my own parents to get it. I have told my own parents to get it. But I don't know if we should be giving it to 16 year olds. I honestly don't understand the rationale for that if we don't understand the long term safety profile and those people are have almost no risk of COVID. 
Thank you, Sarah. Um, this is from Bella. Is there any data showing the virus spreading to slash from household animals such as dogs to slash from humans? Yeah, great question. No, rest assured your dog is safe. It's a great question because this is a very unusual virus in that species barriers are usually pretty strong meaning we don't just free flow viruses between, I don't catch things from my cat all the time. And, you know, the, you know, undercooked fish I ate or, you know, whatever. So, you know, I, it, usually things are very specific about what they infect. SARS-CoV-2, we have been hearing these reports about minks and, you know, there are actually some plus sides to its promiscuity in infecting animals. The fact that it infected a monkey called the rhesus macaque, that single fact is where we lie most of our, you know, sort of gratitude for the vaccines. Because if you don't have an animal to test vaccines in, how do you develop them? And if you don't have an animal that gets infected by the virus, you can't do that. And so um, there are some good aspects. The downside is we don't exactly understand the promiscuous nature of this virus. So far, there haven't been any solid reports of animals giving this to humans um, again, not putting aside that original transmission event in Wuhan any, any further. It's mostly people giving it to people. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, this question comes from Jeff. Do you have any data on percent of false negatives and false positives with the saliva test? Right. So uh, you so the way the the way the the tests work is that you have to be ninety five percent sensitive and specific to sort of get the FDA stamp of approval. So what people will do is they'll adjust their detection limit into the, and this is the right thing to do. I'm not saying that this is the wrong thing to do. They will adjust their detection limit until they achieve that. And then that's why I was saying mine isn't as sensitive because to, to meet the 95-95, we have to claim a lower ability to detect than the, uh, than the, RT-PCR that your doctor uses. And so for that reason, like all tests are 95 specific and 95 sensitivity, which might seem weird to you, but it's because they're adjusting their claimed limit of detection, how little virus can be there and they can still find it until they get to that point. So the FDA is paying attention to all of those numbers. Okay. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the next question is, what was the origin species of the 1918 flu? Yes, um, if I rec well, yeah, so our knowledge about that is, uh, is somewhat incomplete. It's definitely got a bird component to it. It's possible that it was recombinant, maybe even with something from uh, I can't remember if there was something that looked like some of the common pig viruses. Pigs are a very special animal in flu because most bird flus do not infect humans, but pigs can be infected by bird flus and human flus at the same time. So they're called a special mixing vessel species because if they get, if one pig happens to get a bird flu and a human flu at the same time, it can provide a test tube for reassortments and the emergence of novel viruses. That's why pig farming is a critical indicator of flu, you know, sort of flu emergence. And so, you know, right. um, I kind of lost my thread there. I hope that was a satisfactory answer. I'm sorry. No worries. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, our next question comes from Andy. One response to the pandemic has been to de-densify urban areas. Is this of an example of a way to correct an apparent population outbreak? Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking that same thing myself today. You know, it's like, right, you know, you create a pandemic and then none of the tent caterpillars want to live in the tent anymore, right? They all go find other forests and spread out and the virus naturally extinguishes itself because that sort of density dependent spread is broken up 
and isn't it crazy that we are now doing the same thing, you know, and um, boy, I, <laughs> all I know is that, yeah, I mean, when you look at disease emergence, it is definitely true that mega cities are a big problem. Big, big, dense cities around the world um, are really a problem uh, and, you know, spread disease more quickly. And so, yeah, I think that is going to be the effect of us all, you know, selling our homes and moving out to the country. Thank you, Sarah. Um, our next question comes from Monica. Would it be cost effective for small businesses to have the saliva test with um, before admitting customers or patients? Yeah. Um, you know, I think our, our particular test still takes about 45 minutes. So we do have that problem. One of the models we've worked with um, worked on thinking about like restaurants and stuff is if you were to screen your workers and your staff as they leave work each day so that if there's a problem, you know, they don't come to work the next day. It's much harder to do it instantly. The, like a customer walking into a restaurant that wants to be clear. The only test that can do that right now is the Abbott slash Binax now home antigen test card where you can do that pretty quickly on yourself and even get a smartphone passport sent, you know, with a stamp of when you did it. Um, that test has actually the same sensitivity as our test. It's actually less sensitive than RT-PCR as well by the same magnitude. But, I, but don't worry about that. I would argue it's still catching all the people it needs to. The people it's missing are very unlikely to be infectious. They're probably in the long recovery phase. So the Binax Now card is really the only thing we have at this time that could do that. Our next question comes from Heidi. Did you ever think that we would have a pandemic like this? I did. For years, I told my class, I said, 1918. And then in the 1950s, 30 years later, we had polio. I hope some of you are old enough to remember polio, people lining up around city blocks to try to get that vaccine when it finally came out, kids in wheelchairs, horrific, the 1950s and early 60s with polio. So then 30 years later, HIV AIDS in the 80s, and I, I've told them for 10 years, we're due. It's 30 years later. I said, we're absolutely due for the next big one. And then I taught my lecture, a couple lectures later, I had a lecture on emerging coronaviruses. <laughs> and I was just telling the hosts right before this meeting that right at the beginning of the pandemic, a couple of my undergrads saw me in Whole Foods and they're like, Dr. Sawyer, how did you know? And I said, well, you know, because of SARS-1, I started teaching about emerging coronaviruses then. So it's usually kind of the usual suspects, flus, coronaviruses, you know, we know what's out there that, you know, could get us. Thank you, Sarah. Um, what is the risk that COVID variants will become more um, virulent as well as more transmittable and what factors might cause that to happen? Yeah, that's a very nice question. Thank you for that. So, right, just because something spreads better, that has no bearing on whether it's deadlier. Or, or even makes you more or less sick. And so I'm gonna give you the following story that I tell my undergrads. Let's say that Laurel, the host here, and I, we both get corona, we both get SARS-CoV-2, COVID. And Laurel gets a strain that it has, she has a very mild illness. And you know, she doesn't even know she's sick. She still goes out and goes to a volleyball game outside or whatever she does. And I get a variant that lands me in a hospital room two days later. And I'm not spreading it to anybody because I'm stuck on a ventilator in a hospital bed. Which one of those two variants is likely to spread better? Actually, Laurel's low virulence, mild virus will have more progeny and spread better. And so our theoretical understanding and our understanding of the history of pandemics is that viruses and pathogens actually become less problematic, deadly, symptom prone as time goes by because the healthier they keep us feeling, the better they spread. 
So my money is actually on these variants slowly becoming less and less harmful, although certainly I don't think there's data to support that at this time. Thank you, Sarah. Um, our next question comes from Chuck. Do you expect we will need an annual vaccine shot for COVID-19 in coming years like the flu vaccine? It's highly possible. I hope they can put it in the, you know, they might be able to just turn the flu shot into a seasonal respiratory shot. Um, you know, then again, we have seasonal coronaviruses, several of them right now that our children have all gotten. Almost all children get seasonal coronaviruses. Guess what it causes? The cold. And so you've had, if you have children or if you were a child, you've had these viruses. They've been around since before medical people were there to observe them. And so we don't get shots for those coronaviruses because they just cause the cold. Where did those viruses come from? I think it's actually a good bet that each one of them might have started out as a pandemic virus. Maybe it was as severe as this one, or maybe it wasn't, but over time they became less and less harmful and they just became part of our seasonal repertoire. And you know, I'll tell you one thing that this whole experience makes me actually want to get more, more children's illnesses because I think if you've been infected with these seasonal ones a lot, there should be, based on what we're seeing through these antigen tests, some level of cross protection with the current virus. And so I don't want to remain immune naive, you know, and wait till the next big one comes along and have no protection at all. Again, I meandered there. I hope that was an acceptable answer. Sorry. No, that's great, Sarah. Um, we're going to move into our final two questions. The first one is, what percent of COVID transmission is via surfaces? <laughs> oh, because you really want to stop wiping down those groceries, don't you? And I know, so do I. Okay, so this is called fomite transmission. For as long as you can remember, you've had people tell you to be careful of door handles, for instance, because a lot of people touch door handles. And if you get germs on your hands, you can then put them in your face and get sick. And so you should, you know, um, you know, not touch door handles with a hand that you've just sneezed in if you have the flu, for instance. And so that's called fomite transmission. And I think it's been part of our understanding that that plays a very, very low part, you know, small part in respiratory disease transmission. Certainly respiratory disease does transmit mostly by air. The studies I've seen about people getting contamination on their hands usually involves them sticking their finger in their nose without washing their hands. And you can understand that if I had a bunch of virions on my hand and I stuck them right up my nose, that might cause infection. I think that there isn't a lot of evidence that COVID is spread that way or any evidence that COVID, but there's also no evidence that it's not spread that way, at least at some low level. Um, and so I think, you know, it is, a mind, it is a far more minor mode of transmission, but I don't think anybody can rule it out completely. Thank you, Sarah. Um, our final question is, how can we stop another pandemic from happening? I think we have, I think the trick is to catch them early. Only when you can catch them, when, when only a few people have been infected, can you stop them. Once a million transmission chains have started, good luck chasing those down, right? And you give time and space for these variants to emerge. And so the best thing we can do is to somehow have a massive surveillance program where people are just sort of being, when people show up at doctor's offices, how many times have you gone to a doctor's office and they've been like, well, I don't even know if what you have is viral or bacterial. I mean, one way to find out is we'll give you antibiotics and if you respond, it's bacterial. Like how draconian is that? Seriously, right? And so I think instead in that moment, we might wanna actually take a bio sample and figure out what's wrong with that person. When people have like strange symptoms or unusual things, or even just don't let 90% of people with runny noses leave the doctor's office without actually figuring out what they have. Maybe we should look a little harder. And if we're surveying, finding unusual things faster 
we will be able to shut them down better and time will be massively on our side at that point. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us for today's presentation. And thank you again to Sarah for this great information. At this time, we invite you to provide your feedback on the webinar by answering the following poll question. On a scale from one to 10, how likely are you to recommend this webinar to a friend or other CU Boulder alumni? We thank you in advance for submitting your feedback. As a reminder, all webinar attendees will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this presentation, as well as a survey. To view upcoming webinars, as well as previous recordings, please visit our website at www.colorado.edu backslash business backslash alumni. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is tomorrow, as Dr. Mark Hernandez presents on characterization and control of bioaerosols in the built environment in the age of COVID. In the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your time and go Buffs. Mm -hmm.